Welcome to Counter Space Productions. Today we have Courtney Bell and Jeffrey and Ashley Aggie here with us this afternoon. It is a beautiful Sunday. We've been vibing all weekend. Great company, great food, friends, family, and love. What more can you ask for? Today, our topic of discussion is entrepreneurship and education. Uh, Counter Space Gallery, we drew this. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it is myself, Dimitri Powers, and Akil El Amin. We're entrepreneurs, artists, organizers ourselves, uh, doing a range of things um, within our work. You know, over this weekend, we're dropping our album, The Greatest Hits. Uh, we also drop our fall clothing line, which you might see, you know. <laughs> Ain't too much many words to explain it. Um, so this weekend, we've just been hanging out you know, the idea of it was to showcase, you know, what black entrepreneurship could potentially look like. Not what it looks like, but could potentially. You know, I think a lot of people, uh, black people in our communities, we need to see those examples uh, because they're not being shown in our history books, they're not being shown in our classrooms. Um, so it's up for us, everyday people, to come together and show what that potentially could look like. Um, and also invite other people into that space to add on to it as well. Um, the name of the show was Greenwood Avenue. Uh, Greenwood Avenue was a historic street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, it was the main street, which many of us may know, Black Wall Street. It was a street that that street was on. Um, it was originally started by uh, doctors, uh, lawyers, educators, uh, everyday people who had an opportunity um, to do something different. Uh, and that's what we're trying to showcase here today. I'm gonna pass the mic around and have our Educators introduce themselves. All right. Hi, um, I'm Courtney Bell, and I am a social studies educator. I teach ninth grade African American history at my alma mater, North High School. Some callers in the house. Um, I also am a first year doctoral student at the University of Minnesota, um, pursuing my um, doctorate in educational policy and leadership. So. Okay. We need claps for that, too. Thanks. Stop the floor, just get my hands and toe fisted. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashley. I am a school social worker. Um, I am also a community healer. Um, young adult and youth minister and yeah so I'm excited to be here. Oh I'm sorry I'm also uh, the program manager for a nonprofit me and my husband started called Let's Bridge the Gap. Hello everybody uh, my name is Jeffrey Aggie for those who are watching live and those who are being recorded later. Uh, we're like I'm really happy to be here with a group of such powerful people. Uh, currently what I do for work is I'm the chief executive for Let's Bridge the Gap a nonprofit that Ashley, uh, myself, uh, Christina Desir, who works in politics that lives in Boston, um, and Alex Dumas, who is an attorney who lives in New York. And we came together to create this organization called Let's Bridge the Gap because we believe that by coming together, we uh, have the power and the resources to do what's best for our own community. And by focusing on our community, that's the best path to economic growth. Uh, also, I'm a business strategy consultant. That's what I do. I used to be an executive coach, traveling around the country coaching executives. But most importantly, whatever I do, I always do because uh, I grew up in the hood. You know what I mean? Like, and my community is always my main passion, no matter what I do. And so I'm just really glad to have this conversation with Dimitri and and everyone that's on the panel. So thank you. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Appreciate y'all being here with me. Uh, again, our topic is entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and education. Uh, we're sitting here with three entrepreneurs, uh, each individually, and as well as educators. Uh, they're artists, um, all three of them are organizers, um, and they have a lot of knowledge to share with us today. Uh, first question uh, to begin our conversation is, what education is needed to be a successful entrepreneur? I would um, 
say that it's very important for one to have an education of themselves, um, their own history, and the contributions that their people have made to the country and the world, specifically when I think of uh, Africans of the diaspora who are entrepreneurs, it is extremely important for us to understand where we come from and the greatness of the empires that we started and to know um, without doubt that we created what is known as civilization today. Um, and the reason I say that is because oftentimes when one refers to a black entrepreneur, they speak to that as if it is an anomaly, as if it is something that doesn't exist, as if it is something that people should, um, should almost stand in awe for, when in reality, we've always been entrepreneurs, we've always been creators, we've always been innovators, we've always um, been trendsetters. And so I think that if one has a true understanding of their own history, they know that and they feel like it's natural for them to become an entrepreneur rather than something that they have to struggle to obtain. I mean, it's hard to come back from that. I think it's, it's really powerful. One of my favorite books is Carter G. Woodson's book on the miseducation of the Negro. And he makes a very powerful point that we are heavily informed but highly miseducated. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to entrepreneurship, people in general are miseducated, but specifically uh, when it comes to black people, especially young black men and women. Um, so when it comes to entrepreneurship education, I think it's important first to even have education of entrepreneurship. And what is that? That's being able to organize and develop your own business and it's something that you own. And the concept of ownership oftentimes is something that escapes us in the black community, owning our own home, owning our own land, owning our own wealth. So when it comes to owning our own business, it becomes something that fades away. But I do understand and believe that having education that's specifically geared towards entrepreneurship as part of everything that we do is the first step to actually make entrepreneurship possible. And like Courtney said, really, it begins by you knowing who you are, us knowing who we are, us knowing what we're about. And also, not nearly just entrepreneurship for the sake of entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship as an engine for our community's economic development and starting businesses that not only affect other communities, which is really great, and help empower other communities, which is really great, or have products for other communities, which is really great, but with the black community being the focus. And so entrepreneurship education for the black person is not just entrepreneurship education. It's a awakening of understanding and channeling who we are, what we've been doing in the past, and owning that, and creating a business idea that will generate revenue to get us out of the situation that we truly have been placed in by systemic racism and other things that have happened in this country and throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a reason. I'll tell you the name of that. My fault. Okay. When I go like this, it's out. So I'll quick, just press it again. I'll just recap that real quick. All right, cool. Please don't restart uh, it. We live. We live. Let's start. Commercial break. Mm -hmm. How do I stop it? Okay, we're back. We're back, and if you were listening, something's going on radio. <laughs> but there's a reason that I brought these three brilliant minds here today, because they all speak to the key things that we need to be successful, not just as entrepreneurs, but as individuals, as human beings. Uh, Courtney started it off talking about knowledge of self, one thing that we can never forget. And then they continue with bringing up uh, our history and knowing our history. Because, we, because of so much of the black history has been lost, you know, it's important for us to you know, do our, our, our research you know, and study uh, because it's gonna help us uncover a lot of the things we don't even know about ourselves. I think a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we try to recreate the will, you know, instead of remembering that our ancestors uh, pretty much gave us many of the tools that we need to succeed and to, to go forth um, and to better, better in our communities. Our next 
topic of conversation um, is going to be about our education system. And is our current education system preparing our scholars for success? Here. <laughs> um, well, I work at edu I work at um, two elementary schools, and um, I would say no. Um, we are preparing our kids for, in my in my from my perspective, we're preparing our kids for um, just working, you know, regular level jobs. Like we're not preparing our kids to be creative. We're not preparing our kids to be innovative. We're not preparing our kids to think outside of this wide box. Uh, we're also not teaching our kids to a capitalistic system that put the 1% in charge of and put their hands in the pot of over 90% of the world's wealth, or specifically this country's wealth. And today, um, one thing that is unknown to many is that the public education system was created to literally uphold and perpetuate this capitalistic society, meaning creating and producing the workers of the institutions, creating and producing those who man the machines and produce for these institutions. And so our scholars are not if they are receiving a public education, it is not a matter of if or, it's not a question of if, it's a, it's, it's a definitive thing. They are not being educated to become entrepreneurs. That is not the way the system was set up. And that is not the way that they are, that the system is groomed. Um, it's not groomed to push out entrepreneurs. So, um, and honestly, you know, I can go a little further to say that if more people understood the history of edu public education in this country, I argue that many people would not place the amount of trust that they do um, in the United States, in the United States education system, if they knew that it was set up to perpetuate. Um, a capitalistic system where over 90% of the population remain in poverty. Thank you, Ashley and Courtney. Like, I feel like <clears throat> this is powerful stuff. Um, yeah, I agree. I think that the system doesn't do that. I think it doesn't do that for anyone. It doesn't do that for whether someone's, you know, whatever color, race, creed, gender. I think the system is set up to produce mass mass production, to produce workers, to produce people that will work. And but I want to take that a little further. Furthermore, the education system is specifically not for black people. Um, you know, a system. Now I want to be very clear about that. A system cannot help those who it was never designed to serve. You have to understand that with American history, it was illegal. It was illegal to teach a black person how to read or write, punishable by death. A crime to teach a black person how to read or write was punishable by death. Then the very same system who made that illegal would say, if you want to hide something from a black person, put it in a book. Well, if it's illegal for me to know how to read or write, then how is it possible to then blame me for not being able to do that. And then you have uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. So yes, slavery was abolished, but unfair systems were not. And so by law, they have to have uh, black people be part of the system, but black people receive inadequate books, inadequate everything. And so uh, we've always been underserved, underrepresented, understudied, underdeveloped when you look at a college course or a high school course, for example, world history is required or English literature is required, but African history is not a requirement, if it's even there. Even when you go to a historically black college or university, it's not there. And so as far as it relates to entrepreneurship, we can't divorce the topic of entrepreneurship from the topic of entrepreneurship in the education system and what it means to be a black person in the education system. You know what I mean? I think that that's very important for us to always keep in mind that, that it wasn't set up for that. And then I just want to touch on this point really quickly. 
So you had Booker T. Washington, one of the greatest people that I, I love, Booker T. Washington. He has this book called The History of the Negro, has this book called Up From Slavery. If you have a chance, read uh, The History of the Negro, a really powerful book. And one of the things that Booker T. Washington did when he uh, started Tuskegee University was that every week, it was not only to teach people arithmetic or to teach people math or to teach people science. Every week, he would address the students in building character development. For the black entrepreneur, the difference is, is that it's not about profit or money. It's about, it's about developing your community. It's about developing character, which is very different than entrepreneurship as it relates to how America does it. And that's, why, that's one of the reasons why it's difficult for the black entrepreneurs to succeed in America. Because in America, entrepreneurship or business is to generate profit. With black culture, business is to generate equity for your people. And so it's very difficult when you're trying to generate profit while at the same time trying to generate equity for your own. And so oftentimes what happens is if you want to take entrepreneurship as it is or as it is taught, what you will then do is you will start a business that takes advantage of your very own people. And so not only is the education system broken in general for everyone, the education system is skewed to make sure that black people do not succeed. And then it is used as a reason and as an excuse to say, look at you guys, everybody has the same education. How is it that this community does well and that community doesn't? So I think it's very important for us to always remember that as we're talking about Greenwood, as we're talking about Black Wall Street, what they were able to do at Black Wall Street was that people of like minds came together to say, you know what, we can show that it's possible to elevate ourselves. Everybody knows how that ended up happening. When black people generated wealth, when black people generated their own education system, they got bombed, they got destroyed. That's the very same reason why we have the Ku Klux Klan, because they did not want black people to advance. And so it's very important when we're talking about entrepreneurship, when we're talking about education, to talk about the history like Courtney said, but also to talk about how many times black people have attempted and have successfully done things that have been economically powerful, but have been sabotaged by sectors of this country that have been glorified by this country. These are my friends, uh, these are my people. I love them. These are my family. So we learned two things. Not only is our education system terrible, not producing successful entrepreneurs, but there's a second hurdle of being black, you know, being in a terrible public education system on top of being black. So that, that's one huge wall that can be, it, it can be hard to look over. You know, and, and as somebody, you know, myself who, you know, believed in the education system early on, you know, believe that going to college would give me success, uh, whatever that looked like, you know, being young, um, being in a capitalistic society, I thought that was money. Um, you know, I seen that that wasn't, it was getting harder and harder as I got older, as I graduated college. You know, I would say my vision was starting to uh, be blinded, uh, be narrow in sight, until I had the opportunity, you know, until I took the opportunity you know, to use what little funds that I had to go overseas. Uh, you know, me and my brother Akil, uh, also part of the Common Space Gallery, you know, we went over there uh, just to see what the rest of the world looked like, you know, what the opportunities were there. And uh, as we traveled to London, Amsterdam, uh, Paris, Barcelona, you know, we met people that took us in, um, you know, who, who cared for us, who showed us that we were family, you know, which, I mean, also growing up, we didn't speak on this, but growing up in, in a society where, you know, families were intentionally destroyed, you know, as a black person, you can definitely feel lonely often. You know, so having people take you in and treat you like family, that was important for us. But then meeting people who wanted to support us, you know, who wanted to support the ideas that we had. You know, coming back to America, that just showed me that, you know, I can take it, my skills, you know, my talents anywhere, not just to South Beach, you know, but to Africa, <laughs> Africa, you know, to Asia, South America. And that's what, you know, I plan to continue to do. That's what I, you know, I plan to continue to show, you know, any of the, uh, the young people that I'm able to come across. Um, let's go into our 
our second, our third, our third now, conversation started. How do we get career education in school? You know, how do we, you know, change our education system as it stands today, but also necessarily look like career education in public urban schools. It would look like um, it would look like both. It would look like scholars having the opportunity to pursue whatever it is that they wanted and for classical education to be just as highly promoted as industrial education. And I say industrial, specifically I am differentiating industrial from that of career because industrial focuses on you doing that, just that, working for a business, not creating your own. And career education is not and has not been historically in urban districts um, entrepreneurial preparation. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Um, she brought up the point about uh, Booker T. Washington. Um, I also admire the B.E. Du Bois. I think oftentimes what, we, what has historically happened is there's been a clash between one or the other. You also get that later on with Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. But the reality is that both speak to a reality that people were experiencing. Uh, Booker T. Washington, who was a slave, was like, hey, in the South, this is how you gotta handle it. And W.E.B. Du Bois, who went to Harvard, you know, he, he understood what it really meant from a global perspective. And bringing those two points together, I think, really, really, really make that, that, that happen. So I agree with you with that. Um, I also think that, you know, the issue is we're waiting on Superman. The issue is we're waiting on a system that was not meant for us to change, to benefit us. And that is the problem. Now, don't get me wrong, I am a strong believer in equity. I am a strong believer in fighting against institutionalized racism. I am a strong believer in all the words that we could create, quote unquote, white privilege, and all these other words that we, I believe that those things need to be fought. However, historically, those things have always existed and have been fought, and it has not produced change. What does produce change, I can give you a clear example right here, right now. So on Wednesday, Courtney has invited me to her classroom to talk to her scholars specifically about entrepreneurship, specifically about black economics. She has that resource. And being that I've started businesses, being that I've coached executives, I'm able to go into the school and say, hey, uh, young people, this is how it happens. That's the blueprint for success. We all each might know someone who does something, and we have to take it upon ourselves to connect our scholars, so for, to connect our scholars to the people that they need to be connected to, not to depend on the system to create a, a idea of, um, of training. What is it gonna train? It's gonna further train to be workers, as she said, and I think but if you don't have black teachers, or if you don't have teachers that are culturally competent to want to bring someone in, then therein lies the issue. So I think, I think the solution is to bring people from the private sector that focus on entrepreneurship or innovation or technology and bring them into the schools to teach the students what's currently going on in the real world, preferably by someone who is black. But can also be effective by someone who may not be black. First off, man, so what's your name, man? Hey, my name is Anthony Oshifian. Oh, man, how you doing today, man? Man, I'm doing good, man. I'm having a great time being here. So how was your whole experience over the three-day weekend? Yeah, my experience was excellent. I'm so happy that I was able to make it out to both yesterday and today. I missed Friday to my detriment, man. It's just been a positive space of excellence, man. We have art of all different types, um, painting, music, dance, and it's just wonderful to see like us as young like brothers and sisters come together and do something great, man, like with the leadership of, uh, of the Nitric here, man, and, and all the other fellows who are also a part of it, man. So it's just a pleasure to be here. So what do you think about the activities they had going on? Say it one more time. What did you think about the activities they had going on? Like what was your most memorable one? Was it the performances, the question and answering? I think it was it was a question and answer man. That was just uh, so dope to hear like uh, from young leaders like their perspective um, 
on those topics and they're really great guidance and, and, and viewpoint of how do we move forward how can we like uh, uplift our, our people more so I, I just I really hope that is something I can chew on for a long time and, and really use to kind of facilitate this movement moving forward so. so did you so is this like your first day coming or you came to uh, more than one day yeah I came last yesterday man okay. like one to five and uh there was some, some dance performers here, and uh, they, they killed it, man. We had music, and everybody was just kind of vibing out, chilling, looking at artwork, you know, person, some of the some clothing. And it was just a, a good time, man. We had great conversations, bro. And just, uh, it was just positive, man. Like, we got so much talent, like, in that that, that room, you know, that day and today. And it's just, it's just everything that I've been looking for, man, as a young person. So, I'm just happy, man. So